Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, the Senate Majority and Minority Leaders lay out their respective caucuses' goals for the 2021 legislative session, plus a proposal for harsher punishments when law enforcement officers are injured and a debate over clean car standards. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. The most crucial work of the legislature this session is the crafting of a balanced budget for the coming biennium. Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka joined me this week to outline the priorities of his caucus for the session. As of the last budget forecast, the state is looking at a shortfall for the coming biennium of nearly $1.3 billion. Uh, but we have $640 million of surplus for the cycle that ends in June. How is this information shaping your caucus's views about priorities this session? Yeah, well, as first of all, Shannon, it's good to be on your show again. But um, as we think about this, when COVID hit and we got our first numbers, we knew that we were going to be in trouble this year. So as far back as April, I asked the governor to tweak uh, some of the agency expenses. That's what uh, happened in other states. They cut their budgets 5% or I think even 10%. Uh, the governor chose not to do that. And so as we're moving into next year, or this year now, we have a $1.3 billion budget shortfall. And so we have to balance that. In Minnesota, you have to balance the budget every two years. You either have to raise taxes, which we're not going to do, cut spending, or we can use reserves. Uh, and that is uh, for rainy days. And I think you could argue that this was a rainy day situation. So it, it's a big priority. If we don't get this done by July, the government shuts down. So we have to get it done and we will, but we're not gonna do it by raising taxes. And so perhaps you'd like to see some trimming of state agency budgets. Is, the, is that you know where you'd be looking for some savings? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if, uh, the last major budget shortfall we had was in 2011. It was like $5 billion short. Each agent, almost every agency voluntarily cut 5% of their budget and they found the savings. And so that'll be something we pursue. Uh, the reserves are more than enough to cover that budget shortfall as well. There's other levers that we can pull. But Last time around the governor, you know, last session when we had a billion dollar surplus, he was proposing $12 billion of tax increases for primarily the middle class and lower class, and we don't need to do it. And that, that's our point is we can balance the budget. We don't need to have a gas tax. We don't need to have income tax or sales tax increases uh, to close the gap. Now, getting the economy moving to full capacity again will likely alleviate any budget shortfalls in the coming years. Um, it could also reduce the high level of unemployment that we were looking at because of, you know, the effects of the pandemic. What does your caucus propose to bolster economic growth? Well, the number one thing we need to do is, is get our businesses reopened and they need to do it safely. They need to follow the CDC guidelines. Uh, but that's why we've been pushing that. We just know that there's so many other things that are impacted by our economy not up and running. Other states have done it and done it safely, and the results as far as COVID have been just as good or just as bad as Minnesota, depending on how you want to look at it. And then the second thing is, is getting the vaccine out primarily to the elder population first. If you're over 70, I've always said the virus is very dangerous. And I think we're all in agreement now that let's focus on that, particularly 65 and over. And the second step is, you know, let, let's get our, our educators vaccinated so they'll get back into the classrooms. Well, and you mentioned education. That's my next question, uh, because COVID-19 has created so many problems for the K-12 education system among, um, you know, uh, among one of them being the exacerbated discrepancies in learning outcomes. There's also budget problems that districts are facing because of the unexpected expenses of COVID. What will your caucus prioritize to get the Minnesota schools back on track? Well, education is always and must always be a priority. If, if our next generation is not educated, that they cannot uh, perform and be as successful as they want to be. And so, it's why we were so passionate about getting kids back into the classroom. Again, other states are doing that and can do it safely. Not one person under age 20 
uh, that's in a classroom has died of COVID. A younger person did, but so it, it isn't, that's not where it's dangerous, but what is dangerous is for our kids not to be in the classroom. And I think it'll be, as we look back, that'll be a major misstep uh, that uh, the governor did in Minnesota. But, but so we got to get them back in school and we have to look at what's happened in Minneapolis and St. Paul. They, uh, they do not have the options they need to be successful. There's just no excuse. They're falling farther and farther behind uh, compared to other urban areas around the country, they do even worse. And so we've got some real problems in our education system. We're gonna focus on it. Uh, we're gonna ask the house and the governor to, to join us if something's not working, we have to be willing to change it. Governor Wall's use of peacetime emergency authorization has been a significant bone of contention over these many special sessions this last year. Your caucus would like to alter how peacetime emergencies are extended. Instead of the legislature convening to vote an extension down, the legislature would convene to agree to an extension. Why do you think this would be a good change? Well, I, I doubt uh, when they set up this uh, emergency powers in the Constitution that they thought that we would have emergency powers given to one person for over a year, I think is what we'll find out that the emergency powers were given, where he has decisions to do virtually everything he wants to do, except the budget. That's where we have control. And so we, we just simply want to say the House and Senate in the future have to decide together. The emergency was the first two months. We had no idea how dangerous this was going to be. And, and we needed to get resources right away to make sure that we had enough beds, that we had enough personal protection equipment, that we were ready. And we did that in the first two months, almost with the snap of a fingers, we gave the governor $500 million of resources for those things. But then beyond that, the virus is still serious. We're still working towards the problems that it created. But it wasn't an emergency. But the emergency allows him to make decisions without us. And some of those decisions we would have stopped him from. For example, when he said that churches could be open with 10 people, but bars could have 50. It made no scientific sense. We could not stop him. When he closed the zoos, when he set up guidelines so that many of the schools could not be open, those were some of the situations that we would have resisted so that we would have gotten a better product together. Senator Tom Bach, the former DFL majority leader, is now part of an independent caucus that caucuses with the Republicans. Last week, he told me that broadband expansion is a major priority for him. And considering that COVID has exacerbated the haves and the have nots when it comes to broadband, should expansion be prioritized, perhaps even using some of the budget reserve? Well, let's just say it should be prioritized, period. And, and that is a, a focus that I have as well. Senator Bach and I both come from the Iron Range, so that's part of the reason I think that you see this, this natural alliance uh, that has been created here. But broadband for the entire state is absolutely critical. I think we'll find more resources going into that. Would not surprise me if, if we see more and more resources from the federal government as well. We just got to get it done. It's, it's like rural electric of uh, generations ago. Everybody needed electricity, and so they found a way. We're going to find a way. And finally, because of COVID and the fact that it will still take several months at least for the vaccinations to make it into the general population, uh, it's going to be difficult for citizens and lobbyists to interact in this legislative session in ways that are traditional. Should the scope of this legislative session be narrower simply because there cannot be as much public engagement as in years past? Well, that's just another reason why we should limit some of the, the activities and the, poli and the policies that we're looking at. Uh, the bigger reason, frankly, is as long as we're not all there, it is a much, much slower process and so I think both the speaker and I recognize that, and we've asked our people, think about doing less. And, and for sure in the Senate, uh, the, the big uh, issues that there's conflict that like, will, likely will never get done either because the House or Senate stop it. I'm asking people to do a lot less of that so we can do the budget. We have to do redistricting. That's another major issue that we have to do every 10 years. And we get through COVID. And, and if we can get those three things done well, the rest can wait till next year. 
Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, good to talk to you again, Shannon. At a recent press conference, lawmakers called for stiffer penalties when law enforcement officers are injured in the line of duty. I still remember when I heard about Officer Eric Matson's shooting in January. It was actually the next day, January 8th. We had a Senate leadership retreat, and my heart sunk when I heard the news. I think everyone in this room felt the same emotions, anger, shock, sadness, for those of us who live in southern Minnesota, it was as if one of our own family members had gotten injured. Any attempt on an officer's life must be met with punishment that matches the heinousness of the crime. We are going to make sure officers and their families get justice. Today, Senate File 82 is being introduced on the floor, which is a bipartisan bill. It's a bill for an act relating to public safety, increasing the penalty for certain attempts to commit murder in the first degree. I believe the importance of this bill is amplified by many of the events over the last year. Our law enforcement personnel are being asked to protect all of us during times of peace and during times of public discourse to keep us safe. We ask them to follow policies and laws we set for them and we, all of us, have a duty and expectation to respect that authority. I believe that when a per perpetrator of a crime uses deadly force, that they are intending extreme bodily harm and death. After prosecuting the case for the attempted murder of Officer Eric Matson, Officer Andrew Heron, and Sergeant Tim Schrader, it was clear that there was a glaring gap in our current statutes. The current sentencing guidelines only allow for a defendant who is charged in the attempted first degree murder of a police officer, prosecutor, judge, or corrections officer to be ch sentenced to 20 years in prison, and they are also eligible for early release on parole. That means the person who shot Officer Matson could have gone out in only 14 years had he not also shot at Officer Heron and Sergeant Schrader. The current law does not account for if the officer or officers are gravely injured, almost die, have to learn how to eat, walk, and talk all over again, and possibly not ever return to work. Passing this bill would mean a lot to us. It would feel like a big thank you to all the men and women that helped us along Eric's journey. To know that if and when this happens again, that the next family will have better justice than what was offered to us. There will never, never be enough justice, but this is a start. I wish I could say this would be the last time we'd have to prosecute this crime, but unfortunately that's probably not going to be the case. But thank you for acknowledging how um, our jobs as police officers are never normal and that we have a, a number of circumstances that can go wrong and be very tragic. Senator Susan Kent became the first woman to lead the DFL caucus upon her election as minority leader last year. I spoke with her this week about the goals of her caucus for the 2021 session. I think it's fair to say that COVID-19 will be the lens through which we view all budgeting and policy in this coming legislative session. And I'd like to begin with education because the pandemic has wreaked havoc on our school kids. What goals does your caucus have to try to get our schools and our kids and our families back into a better learning environment? This is so huge, Shannon. Um, and this is something we've been working on and fighting for since the beginning. There's so many aspects to it. Um, you know, it, 
it, it's obviously it's about our kids and their ability to keep up with their learning and to be successful in the long run and the challenges that the faces for them, even from a mental health perspective, the challenges it faces for families in terms of having to supervise distance learning. And, you know, we were talking just this morning about um, the, the effects of this on the workforce. It's the top priority um, for so many reasons to make sure that we can have our, our schools up and running full speed, kids learning to their best potential, living their best lives and their families being able to rely on that. To do that, we have to control the virus, um, but we also have to recognize that this has put real hardship on our districts. Um, you know, my district, one of my districts, for example, is um, currently debating a multi-million dollar budget cut. Um, and when we do fully get back in, we're going to have to be able to support our, our schools to sort of do a, an all hands on deck to get kids caught up. This is huge. This is, this is monumental. So this is a huge priority for us, um, both from a funding standpoint. I am hopeful that the new Biden administration and Congress will provide real support to our schools so that they, so that they don't have to make cuts. We need to be reinvesting in our schools so that we can get them caught up and make sure that, it's, um, that, that our kids are positioned to succeed. Uh, numerous stories have been written about COVID-19's impact on workers, especially women and black and Hispanic women most of all. The latest from the December jobs report uh, was devastating and CNN Business reported, albeit nationally, that 140,000 jobs were lost and all of those jobs belonged to women. So women have taken the brunt of this pandemic on many levels. Um, but not just them and not what what can your caucus do? What are you proposing? What will be best to get Minnesotans back on their feet? Uh, well, again, we need to control the virus. We need to get our society and our com economy and our schools open and fully functioning. And that's going to be um, the most important thing we can do for all of these things. Um, but, you know, as somebody who has worked on issues regarding women for so many years, um, and you're exactly right. Um, women have disproportionately borne this, people of color in general, women of color even more than white women. Um, it's unacceptable. It was already a problem. That's the other thing we need to remember. These are issues that are not new. They've just been exacerbated and blown open by this pandemic. So the kind of things we need to do are um, to quit treating women as our society's safety net and actually provide a, a, a real safety net. So if we can have sick leave, if we can have paid family and medical leave, for example, those are the kinds of things that would allow women to not feel as torn as they're having to take care of themselves, take care of their families, take, have a job, um, do so much of the work in the household, take care of their older um, relatives, um, which has been obviously a huge issue during this pandemic. Um, and, and it happens that the jobs that have been particularly hard hit um, and, and have paid such a price in this pandemic have disproportionately been held by low wage, wage workers, also people of color and women. So it's, it's just a it's a hit from a million different angles, and we have to take a holistic approach to this. Well, and we can't leave, you know, the other elephant in the room is healthcare because the pandem pandemic has taken a huge toll on our healthcare system. And an ongoing conversation has been access and affordability of healthcare. I don't even know that it's really understood what healthcare will look like on the other side of this, but what, what kinds of policies will your caucus propose and advocate for in terms of healthcare access? Uh, this is another one where these are not new problems. These are things we've been talking about for years and this pandemic has just um, made them worse. Um, as you indicate, raised a whole bunch of new questions that we still don't have the answers to. Um, the way we finance healthcare in this country um, makes it hard for our care providers, our hospitals and their systems to manage the finances of all of this. We've done some support. There has been other support from the federal government. I'm sure there will need to be more, but this is a bigger question that we need to look at. One very basic thing that we've proposed is the, um, the option, the local, the, the option to buy into Minnesota Care, for example, and give people a choice and hopefully drive some prices down. Um, and to provide some consistency and to give people flexibility to know that if they need to leave a job or if they need to change jobs, they don't have to be pinned in because of health benefits as their reason for doing so. Um, also things like we were able to come together and pass um, uh, access to insulin, affordable insulin. 
Um, potentially, could we do that with other prescription medications? Um, you know, the cost of prescription medications, that's another reason that people are making decisions based around healthcare. Those are just a few of the things, but these are going to be long and complex and important conversations in the coming session and the coming years. Uh, one perhaps upside of the pandemic is that according to the New York Times, this week, greenhouse gas emissions from energy and industry have declined by more than 10 percent. What policies can Minnesota adopt to protect our environment and to, you know, continue to improve towards the goals that we have? This is another critical issue. And as you point out, it's just it, this has given us some interesting insight. Um, and. We know, and I think this election in many ways was about the fact that this is an issue of our times and it is urgent that we deal with it. Um, we talk a lot about clean energy and what that can mean for not just the environment, which is hugely important, but also the economic side of that and the jobs and the good jobs that that can bring to Minnesotans. Um, the other thing that people, uh, we, we have done a pretty good job on clean energy in that regard, but now transportation is our number one source of greenhouse emissions. And so we really need to look at the transportation sector. There's been a lot of misinformation out there about this conversation of clean cars. Um, the reality is that that is where the industry is headed. Um, Chevrolet had a big announcement this week uh, we know that this is a way that we can make a difference and it, Minnesotans want the choice. And so um, these are policies that have been adopted by 14 states and um, the District of Columbia. That is an important step to provide choice for Minnesota consumers and to help um, address this very important issue of, clean, of, of, of our environmental challenges. Uh, and finally, uh, at a recent press conference, uh, you spoke of businesses that have thrived during COVID-19 um, and said that you believe their increased profitability may be tapped to kind of help aid the recovery of the state's finances and, and make sure that the state is on firm financial footing, especially because we may be facing a deficit in the next biennium. Can you be more specific? Are you advocating for some tax increases? When I've talked about this, partly we just don't know right now. We've already seen our forecast has been um, a, a, a changing and evolving situation because the pandemic is a changing situation. What we learned in the November forecast is that um, uh, higher wage workers tended to be able to continue working and spending. They were spending differently, um, but they were still spending. And so we did not see the same challenges that we had um, uh, potentially expected. But what that means is lower income workers have really been hardest hit. And so what we need to do is as we balance all of these things and make these decisions is make sure that we're doing, uh, making um, budgeting and policy decisions that don't add to the burden of people who've already been struggling and paid a huge price during this um, pandemic. We don't know where we're gonna end up. We may have more federal support that may alleviate some of these challenges. Um, uh, but you know, we have, as we've already discussed, have a big challenge for education. Um, just keeping up with inflation will be hard, never mind the added burdens that we're going to be facing to try to make sure our kids are supported and getting caught up. So that's, those are, to me, it's about how we set the priorities. Until we see the real numbers, both from the federal government and from the next forecast, it's hard to talk about what that's going to look like specifically. But I think my point is we need to have all options on the table. Senate Minority, Minority Leader Susan Kent, it is always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. You too. The ongoing debate over whether Minnesota should adopt California's clean car emission standards was the topic of a joint committee hearing. We, you talk about, well, the the climate is the same in Vermont and it's cold there, but Vermont is 9,600 square miles big and we're 87,000 miles big. And so um, the Chevy Bolt gets what, 250, 260 mileage on a charge. Mm -hmm. And in, when it gets cold, the battery life goes down by 40%. So I'm pretty sure I'm not making it to the Capitol in an electric car. In the energy industry, they are ready. You know, they want to put the charging stations. They feel it's tremendous business. It's exciting. You know, everybody's talking about this. Consumers want it. Everybody wants it. 
And if we don't do this, they will be left behind. And so Minnesota will not be in a competitive way because people want these cars and they're going to go out and buy these cars someplace else. You know, let's continue to talk about competition. Uh, basically, in your own uh, statement of need and reasonableness, you estimated that the standards will increase the cost of every vehicle in Minnesota by $1,139. Now, I represent a border district, and my dealers tell me that 20 to 40 percent of their business comes from across the state line. So automatically, you have placed them at a competitive disadvantage. I think we're jumping the gun. I don't think we need to do this until we find out what happens in court. And um, I don't think we need to do this until we find out what the Biden administration does. And I'm not sure why we're in a hurry to do this. And it just seems to me um, we could end up with a whole bunch of electric cars on, on lots. And like uh, to Senator Root's point, that uh, people in rural Minnesota might not want to buy them. And then there's these electric cars on the lots. And you know, who pays for those if they can't sell them? Half of the legislatures and maybe maybe more or less that have already adopted these standards were either by governor rule or by legislature. Let's back up all the way to the beginning. Did, did Governor Wall's administration come to myself or, the, or anybody in leadership, uh, either on the DFL side or the Republican side uh, of the environment committees or, or energy committees and ask if the legislature could participate at all in this or... How did that come about? Because I don't remember the administration asking me if I would participate. You know, this was part of the governor's, you know, initial climate agenda and um, discussion that he'd had, uh, I know, with cabinet and with others um, about his climate agenda. But I don't think he came to you to ask about um, a, a legislative authority to do this. I do have a sense of um, urgency around the climate crisis. We know from the inter, uh, the UN Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change that we have about nine years to avoid climate catastrophe. And so um, what I see here is something actually quite conservative <laughs> um, and, and um, uh, I see, you know, another rule, another year of rulemaking, a two-year waiting period before implementation even begins, and we're talking about models in 2025 um, before this even comes into effect. I, I don't have a problem with electric vehicles. In fact, I think they're probably going to be the wave of the future. What I do have an issue with is when the state tries to mandate something and doesn't even have an idea of what that one vehicle costs. Um, I mean, this is something where an agency that's never regulated uh, in an industry of this kind, as far as I know, is attempting to regulate a large chunk of the Minnesota uh, industry. And I, I really have an issue with that. We're not incentivizing the purchase of electric vehicles, we're mandating it. Even though you know, there's economic challenge for some people, there's a loan program when you buy a car, you know, people get loans. So, you know, um, if, if uh, you're not mandated to buy, but when people choose to buy, you have that option. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.